Welcome back to the channel, Legendary Legacy, audiobook free daily, where you can enjoy the best books without spending a penny. Today, we will continue with the book, Thick Face, Black Heart by author Chin Ning Chu. This is a book that teaches you how to apply the ancient wisdom of Asian philosophy and strategy to achieve success in business and life. We will proceed with part 2, Preparation for Thick Face, Black Heart, 11 Principles for Getting Free. The episodes of the channel are published on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast and other podcast platforms. You can search for our channel by typing Legendary Legacy Audiobook Free Daily into the search bar. Please support our channel by liking, commenting and subscribing so that we have more motivation to produce more audiobook episodes with the best and latest quality. Thank you for listening and have a nice day. Preparation for Thick Face Black Heart, 11. Principles for Getting Free The flower which is single need not envy the thorns that are numerous. Rabindranath Tagore Principles 1, Breaking the Constraints of Inner Images and External Standards Thick Face, Black Heart is not simply a clever way to manipulate the world for your personal advantage. It is the natural state of our being. This state has been lost to us because of well-meaning people who drilled into us all the rules of how we ought to behave and how we ought to feel. It is lost to us because of an inner image we have created of ourselves out of other people's expectations and beliefs. Achieving thick face, black heart means first reclaiming the natural state of our true self. A friend of mine in his late 40s had been 100 pounds overweight most of his adult life. Although he had lost all the weight at least seven times, he would always gain it back. During a psychological consultation he discovered the root cause of his problem. He realized that whenever he was skinny he would act much more aggressive and not be so. Jolly and nice, to others. Since childhood, his family had taught him that the most valued virtue is to be nice to people. Consequently, he ate to suppress his more expressive energy. Beginning with childhood, most of us have been taught that the highest prize in the world is the approval of others. Perhaps it is not stated in so many words, but it is implied in everything we are told is right and good. We are obedient in order to please our parents. We are studious and well-behaved in order to please our teachers. We share our toys so our playmates will like us. When we try to get our own way, we are told we are being selfish and bad. Somehow, ideas of good and bad get tangled up in our young minds with the need to gain the approval of others. In fact, the people who teach us right and wrong are themselves victims of this same confusion. As we grow older, it becomes apparent that to defer constantly to others and seek their approval is not the most efficient way to get ahead. Yet, most of us continue with this ineffective behavior. Sometimes we experiment with selfishness but usually discover that it produces bad feelings within us as a result of our early conditioning. Nice people aren't supposed to be selfish too often. Even though we know that success in our endeavors requires a certain measure of self-centeredness, we continue to be nice. The only reward for this is our self-righteousness about our great virtue. So it is with many of the other selfless virtues. But this is, in fact, pretentious and covert behavior. Often we disguise our concern for ourselves as concern for others, and we continue to purchase the approval of others by giving up our right to get our own way. We often allow others to treat us unfairly because we do not want to confront or challenge them, nor do we wish to disturb our deeply ingrained notions of right and wrong. Instead, we comfort ourselves with feelings of moral superiority. We tell ourselves that we are above engaging in conflict over unimportant trifles. But despite what we think, we turn the other cheek, not because it is right, but because it is easy. A $33,000 Lesson I learned the lesson that, trying to be nice, may not be the right thing to do by paying a $33,000 tuition fee. Jim is a successful Washington DC based businessman. He is one of the most respected people in the world of political forums. 
He books speakers for political meetings and conferences, and publishes a weekly political newsletter. The day we met, we liked each other instantly. He is a warm-hearted individual with a passion for Asian culture. Recently, Jim came to Portland, Oregon, where I was living at the time. He was accompanying a political candidate on the campaign trail. Later, we met for dinner. While we were chatting, I asked how his newly published book was doing. He told me that he had employed a publicity firm on a retainer for the past 10 months and although it cost several thousand dollars per month, he had received many requests to appear on television and radio as a result of the publicist's work. Jim proudly pulled five or six typewritten pages out to show to me. The pages contained a list of the television and radio shows on which he had appeared. Impressed, I took a closer look. Except for one appearance on CAP TV, the rest were only minor radio stations. I couldn't believe my eyes. Why hadn't they booked him on some of the more popular radio and TV talk shows, I wondered. What were these publicists doing for their money? After I left Jim I thought to myself, perhaps he'd like me to give him some help. Because I've been doing my own publicity for the past three years, I've learned quite a bit about the business. I know that to be booked on one popular show is a hundred times better than being booked on innumerable insignificant shows. I also know that some press agents try to justify their retainers by filling their clients' calendar with a clutter of small radio bookings, often having very few listen airs. It is truly no trouble for me to help him out, I thought. I have many good contacts who would take my recommendation seriously. The next day, I called Jim. I said I wanted to help him by giving him some of my contacts and that he could use my name as a referral. He was very happy. He thanked me profusely, then added, I would like to review your new book, The Asian Mind Game, in my next newsletter. The next morning, my phone rang. It was Jim's cheerful voice. I wanted to thank you again for giving me those names yesterday, he said. You are most welcome, I replied. No problem at all. He continued, my company publishes a booklet listing every organization that employs political speakers. I know. I have one, I replied. He added, and this is updated monthly. It now contains over 300 listings. I was not sure where he was leading with this conversation. Maybe he wanted to thank me for my help by giving me an updated list as a gift. But he continued, my secretary tells me you have let your subscription run out. Yes, because I was moving, many things fell through the cracks. I was trying to be nice by lying. The truth was I had six months worth of the newsletter still sitting in my filing cabinet waiting to be read and I certainly didn't want to continue my subscription. Disregarding me entirely, Jim came in for the kill, how would you like to pay for it, credit card or check? Can you bill me? I am in the middle of something and I don't want to stop, I said vaguely. I was feeling very uncomfortable about his pressure to renew a subscription I really didn't want. I tried to be as polite as I could. I wanted to brush him off and get rid of him quickly. But Jim pushed even more. We do not review books for people who are not our subscribers. He wanted his money and he wanted it now. Still wishing to be nice, I said reluctantly, okay, I will go and get my credit card. Consequently, I paid him $300. I had spent thousands of dollars to generate those contacts. Telephone calls, faxes, promotion, travel, it all came to quite an investment, and I gave these to him as a favor. Surely he realized that. He then asked me to pay for a $300 subscription by way of thanks. Of course, I was facing a master thick face, black heart practitioner. He was a thick face practitioner because he had no consideration of what I would think of him. His eyes were on his objective. Although I had not openly said I did not care to continue the subscription, I had sent many subtle messages. He either didn't hear these messages or didn't care. 
He was a black heart master because he was willing for me to dig into my pocket to support his newsletter, even after I had already given him thousands of dollars worth of information. Jim was doing everything right according to thick face, black heart. My mistake was that I didn't even have a business objective except wanting to be nice to him. Worse yet, I hadn't set a value on my press booking recommenda, tie-ins. I gave them away as if they had no value at all. I gave Jim the contacts believing, nice, people do nice things for each other. He was merely being true to his objective, to get ahead. On the other hand, if I had truly given with no strings attached, then what he had done would not have been offensive to me. The truth was my niceness was a false gesture used to try to gain approval from Jim. We can easily fall into this kind of trap. Idealistically we are taught to give expecting nothing in return, but realistically most of us are conditioned to give with expectations. In this encounter with Jim, at the back of my mind, I had been doing my bookkeeping. Our conversation should have gone more like this, Jim, would you like me to introduce you to some of the great shows I was on? They made a really significant impact on the promotion and sales of my books. Jim would, of course, have said yes. I then would have continued, for the past three years, I have very actively promoted my books among television and radio stations. I have gained a great deal of insight. You can sell more books by going on one good show than you can with a hundred small stations or unpopular shows. I would personally like to call these shows for you to recommend you and your book. How much would this be worth to you? Since I would be putting Jim on the spot, he probably would say something like he hadn't intended to pay me, or he might ask me how much I wanted for my service. I then would have said, Jim, I don't want you to pay me in cash. I'm suggesting we set up an agreement to barter each other's services. Let me propose something. These booking connections represent an investment of three years of promo, tie effort. The talk show hosts and I have very good relationships. The time investment alone is worth thousands of dollars. I sold my first self-published book, The Chinese Mind Game, solely through media exposure, with no distribution setup. As a result I earned six figures in one year. I think placing a barter value of about $10,000 would be fair. Don't you think so? If he didn't like the $10,000, I would have negotiated. Once the price was established, we would talk about the proposed barter method. The service I wanted that Jim had to offer was to book me on speaking engagements. Since he charges a 30% commission per booking, in order to earn his $10,000, he would have to generate $33,000 worth of bookings for me. Jim taught me a valuable lesson. Being nice for the sake of gaining the approval of others can be very costly. A genuine friendship in personal or business life can be a tangible commodity, yet it also demands unconditional giving and support of each other. A false niceness with a secret agenda can turn good friends into the worst enemies by thwarting expectations of each other. Principles 2. Searching for your own inner Conviction When his duty is to face danger and he flees, it is cowardice. Mahatma Gandhi Many of us were taught that when someone slaps you, you should turn the other cheek. This is not always the best course of action. There is a time to submit to being slapped and there is a time to hit back twice, so you will not be slapped again. If someone slaps your face, you might turn the other cheek for one of several reasons. Perhaps you have chosen the path of submission with a full understanding of what that means. It might be that even though you feel the impulse to strike back, you suppress your anger because you have been taught that violence is wrong. Or, it might be that you are afraid to further provoke your antagonist. If you turn the other cheek out of an inner conviction such as Han Xian did in the previous chapter, so be it. If you have to suppress an impulse to strike back, it means that you have not truly accepted the truth of turning the other cheek, but have allowed your actions to be constrained by the standards of others. This in turn perpetuates the role of the victim for yourself. If you turn the other cheek because you are afraid to hit back, it does not mean you are morally superior. 
It simply means you are a coward. The thick face, black heart practitioner understands that hitting back does not necessarily make you a bad person. It might well be that in punishing violent behavior, you are acting as a peacemaker. The truth is that most of the common, ly accepted standards of behavior are arbitrary and the arbitrators themselves are often flawed individuals who have perpetuated their own weakness and fear under the guise of virtue. Principles 3, Discovering the Mystery Within the Staunchness of the Oak and the Yielding of the Grass the world consists of a delicate balance of two great opposing forces. Asian philosophy refers to them as yin and yang. All things are composed of these two forces. Things which are thought to be opposite are more intimately related than is commonly believed. Opposites are not two entities which balance each other. They are, in reality, two aspects of the same thing. Darkness cannot exist without light, nor good without evil. Violence and nonviolence arise out of the same place in the human soul. Just as there are two aspects to all things, there are two aspects to human actions, the inward motivation and the outward appearance. Without considering the inward motiva, tie-in, it is impossible for us to judge our own actions or the actions of others. The sage and the criminal might commit the same crime against the state out of entirely different motives. Christ was crucified between two thieves because those who stood in judgment of him saw no great difference between his actions and those of two petty criminals. You need to understand that you possess creative and destructive forces in equal measure. Both complement each other and cannot be judged by common standards of good and evil. Each has its proper time. It is part of understanding yourself and your destiny to know when to exercise your destructive force and when to submit to the destructive force of others. The grass bends easily in the wind. The great oak stands unmoved. A strong wind can uproot the oak, but no wind, however strong, can uproot the grass that bends flat before it. The ideal practitioner of thick face, black heart is the one who has thick face, black heart inwardly, yet whose outward appearance can be dominating or submissive as the situation calls for. He does not have a public or private image of himself to live up to or one that dictates how he must be, have. In the Chinese ancient classic, the 36 strategies, strategy 27 states, pretend to be a pig in order to eat the tiger. According to this concept, when the Asian hunter is ready to hunt the tiger, he will sit and contemplate the easiest way to bag a tiger. The conclusion he reaches is that he will make himself the bait for the tiger. He dresses in pig's clothing and waits in the woods. The tiger will come close, thinking this pig will make a delicious lunch. When the tiger is so close the hunter cannot miss, he will shoot the tiger. In Asia, heroes are not judged for their prowess in hunting and shooting the tigers, but rather for their strength and ability to endure the humiliation of being pigs. When you have no evidence that you are greater than your circumstances, you must never let go of your vision of victory. Einstein noted that a great person knows of his or her greatness long before anyone else does. If you are willing to do whatever is needed to overcome the strongest opposition, even including yielding and being able, when necessary, to look like a pig, you will win. Furthermore, you must be able to endure the humiliation others so willingly impose on you for your apparent failures. A person who can do this is destined to be great. Principles for Understanding Yourself To achieve the state of thick face, black heart, examine the role you are currently playing in this world. In order to free yourself from the domination of arbitrary ideals and discover the true standards by which you should behave, you need to find the courage to do what must be done without regard to what others may think. Extraordinary people don't care what others think of them. Thick face, black heart seems to come naturally to them. They do well in getting what they want because they are unencumbered by others' opinions. However, most people have been conditioned to be affected by the opinions of others. I am not advising you to become an immoral, self-centered person, but to recognize the difficulties that are involved for a naturally caring, sensitive person such as yourself, 
to pursue your own legitimate self-interest. There is something valuable for you to learn from these more detached people, their disregard for others' opinions enables them to focus on the accomplishment of their objectives. This can only be done by achieving a clear understanding of yourself and your actions. Self-observation is essential for self-growth. You must first understand the motives for your own actions in order to understand others. It is especially important to look within yourself in times of great distress and misfortune. If you can succeed in detaching yourself from the misery of your experience, you will see, with complete clarity, the real nature of the situation. The proper course of action will then shine forth. The world is not so simple that we can just make and follow rules about what is wrong and right. We seek an understanding of ourselves so that we will know what we ought to do in any given situation. You will gradually replace the beliefs you were taught with the truths you discover. It is not whether you turn the other cheek that is important. Why you do or do not is most significant. Self-knowledge is a more reliable guide to behavior than adherence to arbitrarily imposed standards, though both are susceptible to error. You will make mistakes no matter which path you follow, but mistakes made on the path to self-discovery will correct themselves. While those made through blind adherence to subjective standards simply perpetuate the folly. In this sifting process, you will discover that many of the concepts you were taught were in fact, correct after all, but your self-examination will not have been in vain. Your beliefs will become your convictions. More importantly, you will have freed yourself from the need for others' approval. But don't take my word. Carefully observe your thoughts and actions. You will see for yourself the false and arbitrary nature of many of the standards under which you are laboring. Within each one of us there is a silent voice that wants to cry out and shout, I exist. I exist. I have needs, wants, and desires which are noble and good. My ideas and rules may be different than yours, but they are mine and deserve to be expressed. Unless I am nourished, satisfied, and fulfilled, how can I be of use to anyone else? Coco Chanel, the famous French fashion designer, started her career not as a designer but as a well-to-do lady of society. She always dressed in the manner she liked, regardless of the current trends. Her unique style, particularly her bobbed hair and raised hemline, went against all fashion standards of the time. When she began, she was heavily criticized for her eccentricities, yet she ended up providing a basis for the radical changes in fashions of the 1920s. Now, nearly a century later, her name, Coco Chanel, epitomizes the very best in the world of haute couture. Recently, I was at my athletic club peddling a stationary bicycle and casually flipping through a magazine geared toward young women. One tip given for gaining acceptance was to leave home with wet hair while carrying a large bag, then run the last half block to the office. The idea was to create the health club before work look. The magazine also encouraged readers to leave a few cassettes by new hot musical groups. Lying around the house to create a hip image, even if they are never played. I fail to see how these image creating devices can possibly help young women gain the success they are seeking. They are merely receiving advice on how to get others approval by spending a great deal of energy creating lies, rather than spending their energy in the pursuit of genuine interests. Principles 5, Breaking the Bondage of Fear of Success and Fear of Failure the fear of success is much more powerful than the fear of failure. That is why there are so many more people prone to become failures than successes. Each one of us is driven to a certain extent by fear, fear to rise, fear to fall, fear that we will remain in the same place. So many of us think that we want to be rich, that we want to be famous, that we want to accomplish great deeds, but often these feelings are just idle ruminations. Most of the things we think we want come at the price of leaving behind our familiar life and venturing into the unknown. Every time we accom, plish something, move ahead, we have to exchange the known conditions of our life for uncertainty and unfamiliarity. Even though most people think they are trying to succeed, 
they are simply going through the motions. The last thing in the world that they want is to get off the familiar treadmill and actually get somewhere. Before we can succeed, we must clearly understand that success means change and the risk of failure. The failure of those who do not try anything great is commonplace and comfortably private. The failure of those who attempt extra, denarii accomplishments is much more public and generally accompanied by sighs of satisfaction from ordinary failures. When we don't pay our bills, a computer somewhere writes us a nasty letter. When Donald Trump doesn't pay his bills, it makes the 6 o'clock news. Success also requires the courage to risk disapproval. All independent thought, new ideas, or endeavors beyond the common measure are greeted with disapproval ranging from skepticism and ridicule to violent outrage. To persevere in anything exceptional requires inner strength and the unshack, able conviction that you are right. Principle 6, Understanding the Nature of Illusion And Reality This is perfect. This is perfect. From the perfect springs the perfect. If the perfect is taken from the perfect, only the perfect remains. Ancient Hindu Scripture In ancient India, a group of young monks were watching their master prepare chapatis, pancakes. He would pour a ladle full of batter out and watch it spread across the surface of the hot griddle and form an odd round shape. As the pancake assumed its final form, he would smile and say, perfect. The students were puzzled. Each of the pancakes was a different shape, some of them were burned around the edges, and none were perfectly round. Finally, one of the students asked the master, Master, how can these pancakes be perfect? Pancakes are supposed to be round and they are not supposed to be burned. The master lifted the last pancake off the griddle and put it on his young disciple's plate. It was shaped somewhat like a gourd. Perfect, he repeated. Once a great teacher told me, if you don't like the world you see, change thy prescription of your glasses. At the time of writing this chapter, I spoke to an old friend on the telephone. We had not met for over ten years. As we recalled some of our past encounters, I remarked, everything that has happened is perfect. My friend said, I don't understand what you mean and I am not sure you do either. The truth is as simple as, change your prescription. There is nothing wrong with the world but your view of it. How do I know this? Maybe you are thinking the same thing as my friend, these are just words. How does she know what she is talking about? The way I know Ms. to be true is through direct experience. Years ago, I spent a great deal of time in deep spiritual contemplation and meditation. One day, after I finished my daily meditation, I was in an ecstatic state. My heart was bursting with love and joy. I experienced that the only substance existing in the universe was love and nothing but love. God had truly created this universe out of His own love. While I was in this state, I got into my car and drove to my appointment across town. On this hot and smoggy summer's afternoon, I was driving along the San Diego freeway in the midst of chaotic traffic. Normally I would have seen Los Angeles and the freeway as an irritating bunch of people displaying their vicious manners and driving senselessly trying to get to wherever they were going. I had always thought drivers in Los Angeles should drive tanks instead of cars. But this time, my experience was transformed, I felt there was only love. I felt that the whole of Los Angeles was an extension of myself. In fact, I experienced that oneness with the whole universe. At that moment, I saw only perfection. Even a chaotic freeway was part of the expression of God's perfection. For me, this state did not last. It faded away eventually. But a glimpse of this perfect vision was enough. I knew then through my intuitive mind that the reality of the world is always perfect, even when we do not perceive it to be so. While I was privileged to have a glimpse of this reality, I also then knew that the very wise ones from the ancient to the present are always living in this state of understanding. In our everyday lives, we constantly attempt to fix our reality. We want it to fit into our concept of perfection. 
A couple of years ago, I conducted a radio interview with Joseph Barbera, the founder of Hanna-Barbera Studios and creator of the animated cartoon classics, Yogi Bear, Tom and Jerry, plus many more. During our conversation, he spoke of how perfectly his life had turned out. He said that sometimes when you are in the midst of it, it may not seem to be going well, but when you look back, then the perfection is apparent. Joseph Barbera was once a struggling cartoonist, making a living by selling his cartoon pieces to New York magazines. He selected some of his better cartoons and sent them to Walt Disney to request a job. For a struggling cartoonist, working for the Disney studio was the ultimate dream come true. Disney replied, writing that he would interview Mr. Barbera on his next trip to New York. But Disney never called on him. Obviously, at that time it was a great disappointment for Barbera. Now as he looks back, he is delighted Walt Disney didn't come to see him. Barbera said, I probably would have become a devoted member of his staff and still would be with Disney Studios today. The concept of seeing everything as perfect is not only a comforting thought when you are experiencing life's major disappointments. It is also a powerful tool for the thick face, black heart practitioner when applied to insignificant day-to-day -day annoyances. As I was writing this chapter, I took a break to run some errands. On the way to each destination, even though they were places I had been to before, I kept getting hopelessly lost. It was a hot summer's day and I was driving a half-ton 4x4 pickup truck. I thought to myself, I really failed to see any purpose for repeatedly getting lost. In the midst of this, the thought of seeing every manifestation as perfection entered my mind. I knew that in the mystery of life, there is perfection beyond my understanding. If our divine maker does not will it, not even a single leaf will dare to fall. I calmly accepted this irritating experience. Although I continued to get lost, my state of mind had transformed from potentially explosive to relaxed and calm. I realized that there are even benefits to be reaped by this seemingly pointless and frustrating experience. At this moment I was able to master my thoughts and to direct them positive, ly. Through this experience, I was reminded of countless other events like this. By having this incident happen to me at this time, it was important for me to share it with you. In this way, we can all look back and examine similar incidents in our past. Consequently, in the future we can place them in the proper perspective of seeing the imperfect manifestation of reality as perfect. I remember a time when unexpectedly stuck in heavy traffic, I had consciously decided to enjoy the view of the San Francisco Bay while waiting for the blockage to clear. I noticed directly behind me in another car, an attractive and professionally dressed woman alone. She was screaming at the traffic and beating her fists on the steering wheel, while her face was flushing to ever deeper shades of crimson. Her irritation and frustration served only to exacerbate her agitation and had no impact on the traffic at all. Like the monks, you may have an idealized vision of how things are supposed to be. But the world unfolds to its own rhythm and purpose. It is important for you to strive beyond the common human understanding, beyond preconceptions of what should be and what shouldn't be. In time, you will see the perfection in the seemingly imperfect manifestations of the world. Principle 7, Master the Distinctions Between Virtue and Vanity While God waits for His church to be built of love, men bring stones. Rabindranath Tagore A holy man's sacred vow A holy man was meditating beneath a tree at the crossing of two roads. His meditation was interrupted by a young man running frantically down the road towards him. Help me, the young man pleaded, a man has wrongly accused me of stealing. He is pursuing me with a great crowd of people. If they catch me they will chop off my hands. The young man climbed the tree beneath which the sage had been meditating and hid himself in the branches. Please don't tell them where I am hiding, he begged. The holy man saw with the clear vision of a saint that the young man was telling him the truth. The lad was not a thief. A few moments later, the crowd of villagers approached and the leader asked, 
have you seen a young man run by here? Many years earlier, the holy man had taken a vow to always speak the truth, so he said that he had. Where did he go? the leader asked. The holy man did not want to betray the innocent young man, but his vow was sacred to him. He pointed up into the tree. The villagers dragged the young man out of the tree and chopped off his hands. When the holy man died and stood before judgment he was condemned for his behavior in regard to the unfortunate young man. But, he protested, I had made a holy vow to speak only the truth. I was bound to act as I did. On that day, came the reply, you loved vanity more than virtue. It was not for virtue's sake that you delivered the innocent man over to his persecutors, but to preserve a vain image of yourself as a virtuous person. The limited human wisdom which guides our concept of virtue often becomes our compelling force for evil. Our false concept of virtue often is nothing but vanity and an attempt to gain praise or to be self, righteous about how virtuous we are, so we may feel superior to others. So many times, because this false virtue is accompanied by a dose of human ignorance, virtue becomes an effective weapon in making humanity a victim. The Crimes Against Humanity When it comes to the victimization of humanity under the banner of virtue, there are no divisions of East, West, Past, or Present. In China, near the end of the Ming Dynasty, early 1600 AD, bandits and peasant forces rose against the Ming court. The rebellious horde rode through villages robbing the villagers and raping young girls. In China at that time, female virtue was sacred. When a young girl was raped, the only option open to her parents was to serve her with a strong poison, thus cleansing the family name. So, when a young girl experienced the horrible fate of being raped, she then had to face the even worse fate of being poisoned by her family. When Galileo made his findings known to the world, namely that the sun does not encircle the earth but vice versa, all the most virtuous members of the Catholic Church condemned him by burning his books and imprisoning him for most of his remaining life. This ignorance, guided virtue is not the sole property of the past. Not so long ago, in the 1950s, the whole nation of the United States went through their own witch hunt, led by Senator Joseph McCarthy. Today, virtuous citizens with sincere intentions attempt to impose their standards and moral codes regarding many social issues onto others in the name of goodness and decency. The question we have to ask ourselves is, can we be so sure that our concept of virtue has not become a compelling force for hatred, intolerance and hypocrisy? Are we not, once more, victimizing humanity? Virtue, contrary to what most people think, is not some thing you wear outside of yourself for public display, as the following story demonstrates. The Whore and the Priest A Hindu priest lived across the street from a prostitute. Each day as he was going in to do his prayers and meditation, he would see men coming and going from the prostitute's room. He would see the woman herself greeting them or bidding them farewell. Each day the priest would imagine and ponder the shameful acts that were committed in the whore's room and his heart would fill with strong disapproval of the woman's immorality. Each day the prostitute would see the priest at his spiritual practices. She would think how beautiful it must be to be so pure, to spend one's time in prayer and meditation. But, she would sigh, it is my lot to be a whore. My mother was a whore and my daughter will be one too, such are the ways of this land. The priest and the whore died on the same day and stood before judgment together. Much to his astonishment, the priest was condemned for his wickedness. But, he protested, my life has been one of purity. I have spent my days in prayer and meditation. Yes, said judgment, but while your body was engaged in those holy actions, your heart was consumed with vicious judgments and your soul was ravaged by your lustful imagination. The whore was commended for her purity. I do not understand, she said, for all my life, I have sold my body to every man who has had the price. Your life circumstances placed you in a whorehouse. You were BOM there, 
and it was beyond your strength to do otherwise. But while your body was performing unworthy acts, your heart was always so pure and forever fixed in contemplation on the purity of the holy man's prayers and meditation. The Morning Morning can be a vain competition among the survivors to demonstrate a deeper attachment to the departed and a greater bereavement. In Asian society this is especially true. While I was attending college in Taipei, I rented a room in the house of a wealthy widow, where she lived with her three sons and their families. During the time I stayed there, the widow, in her eighties, fell ill and was hospitalized. A month later, she was brought home and died. The sons arranged for an elaborate morning ritual and burial. The body was laid out in the main room of the house. For the next week, every afternoon at three a Tao priest would arrive in his huge colorful robe to perform a ritual for the dead and the family would gather for an hour of mourning. As soon as the priest began chanting, fifteen people would simultaneously break out in loud, forlorn wailing. They would alternate inarticulate sobs and cries with articulate expressions of grief. How could you leave us here without your wisdom and guidance, one would wail. You suffered so much because we failed in our familial duties. Another would lament. Each lamentation grew louder and more disconsolate than the last until the bellowing was quite unbelievable. Then, precisely at four o'clock, it ceased and everyone went about their business until the following day at the same time. As the week wore on, the eyes grew drier even though the wailing remained just as loud. It was important to demonstrate the depth of bereavement not only to the other members of the family, but the sound of grief had to carry all the way to the neighbors' houses. My room was directly above the room where the body was laid out. I was completely exhausted just listening to the daily morning. The participants were also absolutely drained. It was with unmistakable relief that they finally buried the old woman. It was not a tragic or unexpected death. The woman had lived a long and very comfortable life. Her death had come peacefully after a brief illness. There was no cause to feel sorry for her at all. In a land where one does not have to walk far to encounter truly tragic and pathetic lives. Her life was a cause for celebration. The morning was entirely for the benefit of the survivors and the neighbors. Virtue is a delicate substance. No one can judge or measure your virtue, not even yourself. When you are truly aligned with virtue, there is no sense of arrogance, righteousness, or superiority. When you are truly aligned with virtue, a harmony pervades. Mourning can be a vain competition among the survivors to demonstrate a deeper attachment to the departed and a greater bereavement. In Asian society this is especially true. While I was attending college in Taipei, I rented a room in the house of a wealthy widow, where she lived with her three sons and their families. During the time I stayed there, the widow, in her eighties, fell ill and was hospitalized. A month later, she was brought home and died. The sons arranged for an elaborate morning ritual and burial. The body was laid out in the main room of the house. For the next week, Every afternoon at three a Tao priest would arrive in his huge colorful robe to perform a ritual for the dead and the family would gather for an hour of mourning. As soon as the priest began chanting, fifteen people would simultaneously break out in loud, forlorn wailing. They would alternate inarticulate sobs and cries with articulate expressions of grief. How could you leave us here without your wisdom and guidance, one would wail. You suffered so much because we failed in our familial duties. Another would lament. Each lamentation grew louder and more disconsolate than the last until the bellowing was quite unbelievable. Then, precisely at four o'clock, it ceased and everyone went about their business until the following day at the same time. As the week wore on, the eyes grew drier even though the wailing remained just as loud. It was important to demonstrate the depth of bereavement not only to the other members of the family, but the sound of grief had to carry all the way to the neighbors' houses. My room was directly above the room where the body was laid out. I was completely exhausted just listening to the daily morning. The participants were also absolutely drained. 
It was with unmistakable relief that they finally buried the old woman. It was not a tragic or unexpected death. The woman had lived a long and very comfortable life. Her death had come peacefully after a brief illness. There was no cause to feel sorry for her at all. In a land where one does not have to walk far to encounter truly tragic and pathetic lives, her life was a cause for celebration. The mourning was entirely for the benefit of the survivors and the neighbors. Virtue is a delicate substance. No one can judge or measure your virtue, not even yourself. When you are truly aligned with virtue, there is no sense of arrogance, righteousness, or superiority. When you are truly aligned with virtue, a harmony pervades. Principles 8, Overcoming Fear Fear is the most destructive of emotions. Fear is to a man's soul as a drop of poison is to a well of spring water. Fear wears so many different masks and comes in so many forms. Deep down in our subconscious we are wise enough to recognize the fragility of how this universe was put together, that our existence and survival hangs on the invisible threads of God's grace. In our conscious awareness, fear is a vague but constantly nagging uneasiness. Most people do not even know that they are afraid most of the time. Once there was a reporter who during an interview asked a well-known national news anchorman, what are you afraid of? The anchorman was taken by surprise and placed in a potentially vulnerable position. He would have to truly expose himself if he were to deal with it honestly. He quickly addressed the question by giving superficial answers, I am afraid of natural events such as earthquakes and floods. The reporter asked him if there was anything else and he said no. The anchorman could not tell the truth for fear of what his audience would think. He was in the public eye and was protecting his public image. It was obvious that one of his biggest fears was to answer this question. But it was not his fault that he felt the need to lie by omission. In general it is unacceptable in our society to admit your fears in a formal or business environment. Wherever we turn, we are face to face with different aspects of fear. It is the biggest barrier for us to overcome in order to experience and fulfill our true potential. If you intend to practice thick face, black heart it is vitally important that you take a good look at how and when fear manifests itself in your life. Although the experience of fear is universal, it assumes different forms for each individual. I grew up in a family where fear was the regular staple served during breakfast, lunch, and dinner. My parents grew up under the domination of the Japanese Imperial Army in Manchuria. Fear was the main element the Japanese utilized to control the Chinese citizens. After the Japanese defeat at the end of World War II, my family then had to live through the devastating experience of the collapse of the Chinese government and their monetary system. In addition, as large land holders, they had to cope with the threat of the new Kamu NIST policy to eradicate evil landlords from the face of the earth. Forced to leave China, my parents' fears were worsened by the hopelessness of living as refugees in Taiwan with three young children to care for. Fear was a permanent resident in our household. The air was so thick with fear that even when we were not afraid, we were afraid. I remember a couple of years ago, while I was lying in bed, out of nowhere a tremendous feeling of fear hit me. I had never before experienced such potency of feeling. Though I could think of no reason to be fearful, I was so afraid that I got sick to my stomach. Suddenly, I realized, the fear I felt was the fear from my parents, fear of the unpredictability of the fragile, material world in which they had lived. I had swallowed their fear just by being in their environment and in that moment, had recreated it in its full intensity. All my life, I have watched how fear works. I contemplate the mystery within the fear. Not long ago, I was in a shopping mall at closing time. I saw a young store clerk, looking terribly frustrated. She was kneeling near a roll-down steel door, with sweat showing through her thin blouse. I asked her what was wrong and if she needed any help. She told me she had been trying to lock the door for the past half hour but she couldn't. She said that until the door was locked, she couldn't go home. 
After I looked at the steel door, it was clear that the position of the lever at the bottom had moved past the slot on the side of the door frame. However, she would not allow me to lift the steel door even slightly, for fear the alarm would go off she told me that once the door was down, if it was lifted, the alarm would be triggered. This young woman's attention was focused solely on the fear of the alarm going off I finally convinced her to lift the door just a bit higher to find the slot. Out of desperation, she gave up her position and we locked the door. Instead of controlling her fear, the sales girl had allowed it to dominate her actions to the point where she was completely inert and useless. Fear does not have to be a negative entity. Through my life experience practicing thick face, black heart I have discovered, aired that there are six elements involved in handling fear. 1. The Usefulness of Fear There is a popular Chinese maxim, the hat is good, the shoes are good. However, if you put the hat on your feet, and the shoes on your head, then both become useless. The emotion of fear is not bad, as everything under heaven has its purpose. If we understand the purpose of fear we may use the emotion of fear to benefit our life rather than empower it to hasten our self-destruction. Fear does not have to be destructive. If we learn to respect fear and channel the emotion of fear for a higher purpose, it will benefit us. Just think, if you never experience any fear, it is probably because you are living your life too safely, beneath your capacity and avoiding challenges. Such a life can be summed up in one word, nothing. An ancient wise man once said, I would rather have fear and worry than nothing. Due to the grace of fear, we learn to respect the laws of nature. We do not foolishly jump into a blazing fire, or drown ourselves in the depths of the ocean. We do not jump out of an airplane without proper training and equipment. Due to the grace of fear, a mother will tenderly watch and protect her child from harm. During the course of my work, a FBI agent contacted me to ask for my assistance. He wanted me to watch for Chinese spies who were pretending to be members of visiting delegatians. He told me these people came to the United States and secretly contacted their people here. I told him that all the people I had come across were who they said they were. Even during my visits to China they were still working at the same posts. Furthermore, what he was asking might give the Chinese government cause to imprison me and I had no desire to spend my retirement in a Chinese jail. I was not afraid to be honest about, nor was I ashamed of my great fear of Chinese jails where human rights are given no consideration at all. As a matter of fact, he was rather relieved at my unwillingness to cooperate. I think one of his objectives in speaking with me was to find out whether or not I was sympathetic to the People's Republic of China, above and beyond my allegiance to the United States of America. Do not be afraid of fear. Employ thick face, black heart to shield and protect you from your illusion of harm. Our Creator did not place fear in our hearts in order to destroy us, but rather to guide and protect us. Understand your fear, befriend your fear. Talk to your fear, and ask how you can utilize it for your benefit rather than your destruction. To the grace of fear, I pay respect and bow deeply. 2. The Eyes of Fear the content of fear may be intense and gripping, so much so that it overwhelms us completely but when we look beyond that content at the fear itself, what do we find? Pure energy, energy which, if we focus on it directly, will begin to reveal its real nature, then, instead of filling us with agitation, the energy of fear can actually lead us to a state of exhilaration, or intense concentration or love. Ancient Hindu Scripture To overcome fear, First you have to find the courage and will to confront fear. Fear is never so terrifying once you look into its eyes. A thick face, black heart practitioner will use his spear to pierce the eye of fear. For no apparent reason, I have been always afraid of deep water. Whenever I was swimming in the deeper part of a pool, I felt panic and fear. Whenever I took a dive, from the moment my body touched the bottom until I came up, I felt that the time seemed unbearably long. Fifteen years ago, I took a cruise to the Caribbean. 
While the ship was anchored in the U.S. Virgin Islands, I took a deep sea diving class. I decided to take a look at what it would really be like if I went down to the bottom of the sea. After a half hour of brief instruction, with a group of 10 people and an instructor, I walked into the sea with my oxygen tank. While in the water, whenever my mind thought about being at the bottom of the sea, I felt fearful. I would then say to myself, I am one with the ocean, I am one with the all the creatures in the ocean. I am God's child. Wherever I am, I belong. I have the same right as the fish to make this ocean my own. These were not just words, they were direction and guidance for my mind. The words became thoughts and experiences. I then felt at ease with the idea of swimming at the bottom of the sea. My diving experience was the highlight of my whole trip. In fact, it was one of the highlights of my life. I knew then that I could master my fear at will, I just had to look into its eyes. Years ago, I decided to organize and conduct a full-day seminar about how to do business with Asians. The morning of the seminar while I was dressing, I was overcome by fear. Suddenly it hit me, I had never spoken in front of any large groups. What if I opened my mouth and nothing came out? What would this do for my professional reputation? How would I get through this day? In that instant, I had envisioned the entire day and was convinced I would fail and be devastated. Edition. As I was driving towards the hotel, I thought to myself, I either shape up or admit defeat. I decided the only way I could get rid of my fear was to stop wanting to avoid the feeling of being fearful. To stop resisting it. The more I did not want to feel fearful, the more intense the fear got. I mentally took my fear from my heart, placed it in front of me on my dashboard, and started to stare into this fear with great intensity. I said to myself, let me be more fierce than fear itself. Suddenly the fear I had been feeling was replaced by the intense courage that I had created to stare at the fear. By the time I arrived at the hotel, I was charged with power and enthusiasm. My first seminar was a great success. After I had finished at 4 o'clock p.m., no one wanted to leave, they wanted to hear more. My experience was not extraordinary. Often the bravest warriors were originally the greatest cowards. The more fear you confront and conquer, the greater courage you will possess. 3. Diversity is fear. The most profound knowledge is often only available through direct perception and experience. Words alone are never sufficient to explain such mysteries. Understanding the nature of fear and how to take control of it is of great importance in our daily life. Knowing the source of fear is the essential element, without it, your understanding of fear will not be complete. The profound and simple truth is that the universe was created by our Divine Maker. He created the whole universe out of Himself and no other substance. In reality all things and creatures are one with our Maker. Just as in the material world, all elements consist of atomic particles, yet they are manifested as infinitely different forms. Whenever we expiry, ins ourselves as separate from that power of oneness, fear enters. When I was afraid of deep water, the source of my fear was that I experienced myself as being separate from the water. When I focused my mind and heart and concentrated on becoming one with the water and all the creations within, then I expanded to include the water and the one who created the water. I also was included within it. A friend of mine shared with me that normally, she is extremely afraid about the judgments and opinions of others. For her, this was a source of constant anxiety. Once, after completing a spiritual retreat, for a few days, she experienced a state of complete serenity. She was without fear. In this state of fearlessness, there was no effort needed not to be afraid. There was simply a sense of pure peace, serenity, harmony and great clarity. A feeling of well-being in which she saw that although she was different from others, in essence she was the same. There was no diversity. She experienced that all of creation was one with the Creator. Yet she was not consciously experiencing the thought. In that oneness, you are part of the whole in each pulsating moment of time. 
thought does not exist. This harmonious state is experienced by those who dedicate their lives to vigilance in practicing the highest form of thick face, black heart. To obtain this state is within human reach, but make no mistake about it, it is only through rigorous vigilance and practice that it will manifest. The experience of diversity manifests in a way that affects our daily lives. For example, in the business world whenever a salesman sees that his own interest is the opposite of his potential customer, he is fearful. He sees that in order for him to make a dollar, the potential customer will have to dish out ten dollars. Deep down, he knows he is a noble human being. He does not wish to have a total stranger lose ten dollars so he may gain one dollar. Consequently, he is afraid to approach the customer. If the salesman took a different perspective and sought unity among his customers' interests, then his fear would not exist. Would you be afraid if you knew for certain that by communicating information concerning your service or product to the potential buyer, he would benefit tremendously? In our daily lives, whenever you can find unity among diversity, you will experience no fear. 4. Master Detachment Performing your duty without attachment or aversion is a great antidote to the poison of fear. Bhagavad Gita If you are not concerned about the outcome of a circumstance, you will experience no fear. When you attach yourself to expectations, anxiety and fear will overcome you. The outcome will be what it will be, regardless of your expecta, tie-ins and fears. 5. Ignoring the fear I am an old man and have a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. Mark Twain For most of us, fear is not grounded in any real possibility of catastrophe, rather it is a state of emotional uneasiness. Mark Twain clearly understood this well as he said that most of our worries and fears never come true. That feels the light and sings when the dawn is still dark. Rabindranath Tagore this is the essence of the message of fear. During your daily encounters, in spite of your fear, do what you have to do. You, as the thick face, black heart practitioner will press ahead and walk through the clouds of fear that may arise on your path to success. Principles 9, Voyage Beyond the Avoidance of Pain And the Pursuit of Pleasure The man who is not troubled by pain and pleasure, who remains the same, he is wise and makes himself fit for eternal life. Bhagavad Gita Beneath the fear of success and failure is the fear of pain. The most motivating factor in human actions is the desire to avoid pain and do what promises us pleasure. There may be religious individuals who would argue that this is not so with them. The aim of devotion, however, is the possible deliverance out of eternal pain into eternal pleasure, the bliss of God. If an individual can convince others that doing things his way will increase the pleasure of living and lessen the pain of life, that individual would certainly be a popular man. Just look at political speeches given during the past hundred years. They have changed very little, if you vote for me, your life is going to be better, you will have more money to spend, your children will have a higher standard of education to ensure their prosperous future, you will have luxurious low-cost housing, you will have a strong defense, you will have cultural programs to enrich your lives, and I promise you that there will be no increase in taxes. Whoever can paint the most convincing mental picture gets elected. Hitler understood this principle. When he came to power in 1930, Germany was in a deep economic slump. The German people were still carrying the heavy disgrace of their defeat in World War I. They were suffering both physically and emotionally. Hitler's socialist Nazi party promised a better economic life and the possibility of a re-glorified Germany. The promise of a better life was more attractive than their harsh and hopeless reality. The German people opened their arms and embraced him. Hitler delivered his promise. He brought Germany out of economic depression and went on to unite the German-speak ING world. In 1938 he was at the top. According to some historians, if Hitler had died in 1938, he would now be known as the greatest statesman in the history of Germany.
Eva Duarte Perón of Argentina, popularly known as Evita, seemed to have acquired something akin to sainthood by the time of her death in 1952. She used only one weapon to secure the dictatorial position of her husband. She convinced the poor masses of Argentina that she and her husband were their only hope for a better life. She used herself as an example, having been raised in the slums of Argentina. Follow me. You too can rise to the top. Argentina believed her. Hitler delivered something tangible. Eva Perón delivered hope. Both convinced the masses that they had the means to lessen the pain and increase the pleasures of life. Half a century later, people have not grown wiser. We are still eager to embrace anyone who promises to increase our pleasure and lessen our pain. We operate our whole lives out of a desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. We are like laboratory rats who have found out which door hides the cheese. Our former president, Ronald Reagan, is a master at manipulating this simple human emotion. In order to fulfill his promise of making the American people feel good, he had to create a false prosperity. He borrowed against America's future, turning the United States from the largest creditor nation to the largest debtor nation in eight short years. History has proven that the blind pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain causes the human race to sabotage itself. We blindly pursue individual pleasure at any cost, and rob ourselves of our possibility to be great. The remedy to cure this current national character defect is thick face, black heart. Abraham Lincoln understood that the price of greatness lay beyond the pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain. He fought for the very existence of the principle of democratic government and was willing to risk the devastating destruction of his beloved nation. Principles 10 Acquire the Courage to Believe in Yourself Many of the things that you have been taught were at one time the radical ideas of individuals who had the courage to believe what their own hearts and minds told them was true, rather than accept the common beliefs of their day. In the world of science, Galileo and Darwin come immediately to mind. Their ideas questioned the cherished belief of man's preeminent place in God's universe. They threw the dogmatic religious establishment into paroxysms of rage. I spent the first part of my life in provincial China and the subsequent years in modern America. Time and time again I have noticed how customs that seem of such fundamental and unquestioned importance in one culture reveal themselves to be trivial and arbitrary when viewed from the perspective of a different culture. I remember an old woman who lived in our street when I was a child. We children called her Auntie Wong. Though elderly, she was a lively and energetic person. Like the other women of her age, she dressed in the old style and pulled her hair back in a neat bun, ornamenting it with a jade and silver stick pin. But unlike the other old women, Auntie Wong moved purposefully when she walked. She did not hobble slowly on tiny, broken and disfigured feet. In Auntie Wong's youth it had been the custom to break the bones of young girls' feet and then bind them tightly with the toes bent under so they would heal into tiny, deformed feet. It was ingrained into people's thinking that these Ms. Chopin feet were a necessary component of female beauty. Besides being thought of as beautiful in and of themselves, bound feet caused a woman's hips to sway in what was considered a most irresistible manner. But sensuality really had nothing to do with it. A woman's hips swayed because she could not walk straight. But Auntie Wong's mother had been a woman of enormous courage. She forbade anyone to bind her child's feet. She physically restrained the members of her outraged family from performing the ritual. For the remainder of her life, she stood as a shield between her daughter and those who would cripple her. When Auntie Wong's mother died, Auntie Wong was 13 years old and her feet were already much too large to bind. From the vantage point of 20th century America it is easy to minimize the enormity of Auntie Wong's mother's courage. Foot binding is to us such an obviously barbaric and pointless practice that it seems common sense would prohibit it. However, in Auntie Wong's world, only servants and peasant women had unbound feet. It brought great shame on her family to have a daughter whose very feet proclaimed her to be coarse and without breeding. 
but many old customs changed in China during the early years of this century. Foot binding fell out of favor. Anti Wong's generation was the last to be subjected to it. Rather than spending her life as a social pariah, Anti Wong was one of the few women of her generation to be in tune with the prevailing standards of the new China. The women who had been crippled by foot binding grew old as relics of a bygone era. The invisible chains of customs and cultural practices are more binding than the shackles of iron. Your life will be very difficult if you violate accepted standards of conduct without important reasons. Nonetheless, as a thick face, black heart practitioner, it is essential to break free from the bondage and have the courage to be true to your convictions. Principles 11. Realize the thick face, black heart. Nature of the Creator To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes, the Holy Bible Most of the religions of the world recognize a creator or creative force. They may differ regarding his specific identity in many of his attributes, but there is surprising agreement on the idea that all things happen through the will of this creator. One of the great mysteries of religion is why a benign and omnipotent creator would allow suffering to come into the world. God may mark the sparrow's fall, but he never the less lets him fall. The creator's destructive force is so violent and causes so much human misery, both through the blind forces of nature and the actions of the wicked, that he seems callous and unjust. But the created universe is huge, spanning unthinkable ranges of time and distance. Galaxies coalesce out of clouds of dust drifting in the vast icy blackness of interstellar space. Stars ignite, planets form and life begins. Eventually it is all consumed in its own fire and returns to dust, ready for the cycle to begin again. The Creator does not modify His plan for the convenience of an infinitesimal fragment of creation, nor does He explain Himself. The universe is run according to immutable principles that are far, far greater than our small concerns. Creation and destruction are not opposites, as they seem. They are two aspects of a single force. The universe is a constant cycle of creation and destruction. Both are equally necessary. As I write this, there is a huge forest fire raging out of control in the mountains nearby. Despite the fact that scientists clearly understand the need for periodic fires to maintain a healthy forest, hundreds of men using millions of dollars worth of equipment are frantically trying to extinguish the flames. The local timber industry cannot see beyond its need for the standing timber being lost. Animal lovers lament the loss of animal life without considering that this cataclysm is a necessary and natural part of preparing the way for the generations of wild beasts to come. Only the Creator has a face thick enough and a heart black enough to allow His grand design to unfold without concern for these matters. Often when we categorize something as wrong or bad, it is because we do not possess the breadth of vision to see its necessity in the overall scheme of things. Summary of Key Points Breaking the constraints of the inner images and external standards, from childhood, most of us have been taught that the highest prize in the world is the approval of others. Perhaps it is not stated in so many words, but it is implied in everything we are told is right and good. Thick face, black heart is the natural state of your being. This state has been lost to you because of well-meaning people who drilled into you all the rules about how you ought to behave and how you ought to feel, and it is also lost to you because of an inner image you have created of yourself out of other people's expectations and beliefs. You must reclaim the natural state of your true self. Searching for your own inner conviction, there is time to submit to being slapped and there is a time to hit back twice. It is not whether or not you turn the other cheek that is important. It is why you do, or do not, that counts the most. Discovering the mystery within the staunchness of the oak and the yielding of the grass. The grass bends easily in the wind. The great oak stands unmoved. A strong wind can uproot the oak, but no wind, however strong, can uproot the grass that bends flat before it. The ideal practitioner of thick face, black heart is one who possesses thick face, 
black heart inwardly, yet whose outward appearance can be dominating or submissive as the situation demands. He does not have a public or private image of himself to live up to or one that dictates how he must behave. Understanding yourself, in order to free yourself from the domination of arbitrary standards and discover the true standards by which you should behave, you need to find the courage to do what you must without regard to what others may think. Self-observation is essential for self-growth. You must first understand the motives for your own actions in order to understand others. Self-knowledge is a more reliable guide to behavior than adherence to arbitrarily imposed standards. Breaking the bondage of the fear of success and fear of failure, success means change and risk of failure. The failure of those who attempt extraordinary accom, plishments is much more public and generally accom ponied by size of satisfaction from ordinary failures. Success also requires the courage to risk disapproval. All independent thought, new ideas, or endeavors beyond the common measure are greeted with disap, provol ranging from skepticism and ridicule to violent outrage. To persevere in anything exceptional requires inner strength and the unshakable conviction that you are right. Understanding the nature of illusion and reality, in our everyday lives, we constantly attempt to fix our reality. We want it to fit into our concept of perfect time. Seeing everything as perfect is not only a comforting thought when you are experiencing life's major disappointments, it is also a powerful tool to the thick face, black heart practitioner when applied to insignificant, day-to-day -day annoyances. Master the distinctions between virtue and vanity, the limited human wisdom which guides our concept of virtue often becomes the compelling force for evil. Our false concept of virtue often is nothing but vanity and an attempt to gain praise or to be self-righteous about how virtuous we are, so we may feel superior to others. Often, because this false virtue is a compa need by a dose of human ignorance, virtue becomes an effective weapon in making humanity a victim. Overcome fear, fear is to man's soul as a drop of poison is to a well of spring water. Everything under heaven has its purpose. If we understand the purpose of fear we may use the emotion of fear to benefit our life rather than empower it to hasten our self-destruction. Fear is never so fearful once you look it in the eyes. In reality all things and creatures are one with our Maker. Just as in the material world, all elements consist of atomic particles, yet they manifest themselves in infinitely different forms. Whenever we experience ourselves as separate from that power of oneness, fear enters. When a salesman sees his own interest is the opposite of his potential customer, he is fearful. When a salesman seeks unity with his custom or his interests, then his fear does not exist. If you are not concerned about the outcome of a circumstance you will experience no fear. Whatever the outcome will be, will be, whether you fear it or not. Don't give your fear too much importance. An ignored guest often departs unannounced. In spite of your fear, do what you have to do. Voyage beyond the avoidance of pain and the pursuit of pleasure. We operate our whole lives on the desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. We are like laboratory rats who have found out which door hides the cheese. History has proven that the blind pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain causes the human race to sabotage itself. The price of greatness lies beyond the pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain. Acquire the courage to believe in yourself. Many of the things that you have been taught were at one time the radical ideas of individuals who had the courage to believe what their own hearts and minds told them was true, rather than accept the common beliefs of their day. Realize the thick face black heart nature of the Creator. Destruction is an essential part of creation. Only the Creator has a face thick enough and a heart black enough to allow His grand design to ruthlessly unfold. The Creator does not modify His plan for the convenience of an infinitesimal fragment of creation, nor does He explain Himself. The universe is run according to immutable principles that are far greater than our small concerns. According to your life, your duties have been prescribed for you, follow them and your desires will be naturally fulfilled. Bhagavad Gita